a year if you know Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. This is not just a one-time <coughs> celebration. Or the two-time. Or a two-time. That's right. <laughs> Christmas and Easter. Amen. Yeah. But we celebrate Jesus Christ 365 days a year. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. My, my, my. And this, this celebration that we talk about and that it was so miraculous, this event that we celebrate, Hallelujah. <clears throat> Did not just happen one night in Bethlehem. It wasn't just something that happened that night that just, well, you know, that just occurred. This was something that had been coming for a long time. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, God was telling us through His Word and would tell them in the Garden of Eden that He was sending His Son, a Redeemer, a Savior. Amen. He would prophesy himself of the virgin birth in Genesis the fifth chapter, the uh, third chapter, the fourteenth verse. The Bible says, "And the Lord God said unto the serpent, I like how He tells the devil, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. This is what's coming. Mm -hmm. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman." And between thy seed and her seed. It's important that you catch that this morning if you're out there this morning and listening and if you've never thought about that. Those two words, her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Her seed. When the Bible speaks of seed and it speaks of lineage, it always talks of the man. But here when it talks about Eve, it talks about a woman's seed. It lets us know that this seed that would come forth that would defeat the enemy would not be born of man but would be conceived of the Holy Spirit of a virgin by the name of Mary and we don't just find it here in the book of Genesis we find the prophet Isaiah 700 years before the birth of Jesus Isaiah would speak these words therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel he would also say, the prophet Isaiah, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Talking about who? Talking about Jesus who was to come. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, speaking of the Son of God that would be sent, to redeem man, a lost and dying world, on its way to a devil's hell, God would love us so much that He would give His only begotten Son. And Isaiah would prophesy of that. The prophet Micah would prophesy of the place of His birth. Whenever he would say in Micah 5 and 2, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, thou, though thou, thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee, shall he come forth unto me that is to be a ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old and from everlasting so the Bible tells us over and over can you imagine God's people as they would pass down the scripture from generation to generation as they would hear it from daddy as they would hear it from grandpa how that there was a Messiah coming there was a Savior coming and no doubt many of them would give up hope throughout the years and they would think, well, you know, we've heard that all our lives. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We've heard that. And that's the same way it is with the coming of the Lord today. Amen. Mm -hmm. They've heard, I've heard from, since the time that I was just knee-high to a grasshopper sitting on the end of the pew at Brother Hinton's, Jesus is coming. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And that's the way it was with the people, the people of Israel, the Israelites, the Jewish people. That's the way it was with the Jews. Yeah. They had heard the Savior's coming. The Messiah's coming. There's a Redeemer coming. There is a balm in Gilead that will be birthed. There it will be a sign that a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. Not only that, John in the first chapter would say that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We just read where it said that God would be with us. Emmanuel. You will call His name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So they had heard all through the years that there was a Messiah coming. Many of them, no doubt, had fallen to the side by doubt. 
They had thought, well, he's never going to come. That's the way it is today with the coming of the Lord, what I was saying a while ago. Many times people say, well, I've heard that. I've heard Jesus is coming. I don't really think. You know, the uh, according to the Mayan calendar, we ain't supposed to be here right now. The uh, their, their calendar ended on the 21st, and it was all supposed to be over. Amen. And I, I told them yesterday, I don't know what's worse. The ones that predict the end and sit and wait for it to happen, or those who think the end's never going to come. Amen. Amen. Because the next day, of course, they were making fun and they were talking about that, but they don't just do that with the Mayans. They do that with anyone who talks about Jesus coming, who talks about the end of the world. They act like this world's going to be here forever. They're just going to carry on their life forever. Listen, even if Jesus doesn't come back in our generation, sooner or later, you fix it to die and push up grass somewhere. Amen? Sooner or later, surely, we have stood by the graveside of enough loved ones to believe in death this morning. You may not believe Jesus is coming back. You may not believe there's going to be a rapture, but sooner or later, you fix it to be dead on the doornail. Amen? And there is... A an everlasting life somewhere, either in hell or in heaven. And this promise to the Jewish people, oh, this would make all the difference in the world. Micah would say that he would be born in Bethlehem. God would tell them in the book of Genesis that he would be born of a virgin. Isaiah would prophesy 700 years. Get that this morning. How many times has God told you something or promised you something and when it didn't happen the next day you got discouraged. When it didn't happen the next week, you got discouraged. When it didn't happen the next month, you got discouraged. When it didn't happen the next year, you gave up. Amen. That's the way it is a lot of times. But this was 700 years before that night in Bethlehem. Isaiah would stand and say, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Emmanuel. So all through the years, they would Talk of this coming Messiah. Even down to Genesis, the 49th chapter, the 10th verse, it would tell us that He would come of His lineage foretold to be of the tribe of Judah. Listen to what it says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between His feet, until Shiloh come. And unto Him shall the gathering of the people be. Talking about Jesus. It would talk about that He would be birthed from the lineage of David. And Matthew and Luke both, whenever they talk about the genealogy of Jesus, trace it back through the genealogy of David. So all of these promises, all of these prophecies lead up to this night in Bethlehem. <clears throat> now there have been a lot of babies born in Bethlehem over the years. Many times there had been cries made. Babies that were just born, got to slap on the bottom and they cried, you know. But this cry would be different. Amen. <laughs> I don't believe, you know, we, we sing about silent night. I don't believe it's all that silent when he came out. I think he's like all the other babies. I think he squalled. Amen. Amen. But I think out of all of the cries that the enemy had ever heard before, he'd heard babies cry before. Amen. He had moved on the hearts of evil kings to cause babies to cry. Amen. To kill them. But this night would be different. In the stillness of the night, in an overpacked, overcrowded city of Bethlehem, they were all there for the census. There was no room for them in the inn, not even any place for them to get to rent a room. So they're in the barn or in the cave out back, laying on the hay. Out of all of the hustle and bustle, can you imagine the noise? Amen? Think about Black Friday. All the noise made of that. This, that was nothing compared to this. The streets of Bethlehem are jam-packed with people going and coming and talking and laughing, making all this noise. You can hear all of that. Oh, but I tell you, there's one thing that the devil heard that night. Amen? Above all of that crowd, the, the cry of a baby in the stable out behind the inn. Amen? Oh no! Shadow has come! Amen? He had tried throughout the years to stop the seed from coming forth, yet here it is. He had tried to stop God from bringing the Savior into the world, yet here it is. The cry that is made in Bethlehem's night would shake the very foundations of a devil's hell. 
And how miraculous was this event? The father made a big deal over the birth of his son. More so than any event that's ever taken place in the history of mankind. The Bible says in Luke, go with me to Luke the second chapter. Luke the second chapter. I'm not going to hold you very long this morning. Oh, I feel a preacher coming on me, but I, I'm going to try not to hold you very long. Luke the second chapter, beginning of the first verse. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made by Serenius, who was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. She's about to give birth. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. Now up till this had been kind of quiet as far as what you could see was going on. Mary and Joseph, you know, they pushed their way through the crowd and they got to the inn and they knocked. They wanted some, Joseph wanted so badly somewhere warm and safe for his espoused wife that was about to give birth to the child. Amen. Only to hear from the innkeeper that there was no room. We're full up. There's no room. There's no room. There's no room for you here. He's hearing the same thing today. Amen. Amen. 2,000 years later, there's no room Amen. for you here. Sharon K. King wrote a song that's called, Is There Room in Your Christmas for Jesus? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. There's no room. Even down to the place to where they took the name Christ out of Christmas and replaced it with an X. Amen. And you have the ACLU wanting to... People not to call it Christmas, call it a holiday season, call it winter fest, whatever, amen. There's a reason that we celebrate, and that reason is not because of winter. It's because of Jesus Christ, our Savior, born, amen, to a virgin, Mary, that we're talking about this morning. So here they are, they no room for them in the inn. She brings forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. The Bible says there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, God has commissioned, and we're getting ready to see, the announcement of the birth of His Son by the heavenly host of angels. The only time you'll find this in the Word of God. And we find Him announcing this to who? Shepherds. Now Bethlehem was full. It was full of people that it came from all over the place for the census. So no doubt there were rulers in Bethlehem. No doubt there was some royalty in Bethlehem. No doubt there were some important men in Bethlehem. There were some religious men in Bethlehem. But God chooses these shepherds out on the hillside just outside of Bethlehem to announce the birth of His Son. Letting us know that it's not in the importance of the man, but it's in the importance of the Savior. Amen? Letting us know that it's not in your status in society. Letting us know that whosoever will, he would pass by all of these men of, of high regard. And he would speak to these shepherds, these lowly shepherds that most men wouldn't give them the time of day. They stunk. They smelled like sheep. They were rough men. They, would, they lived out on the hillside with the sheep. Yet he would choose these men to announce the birth of his son. It's no coincidence that it would be shepherds. Jesus would call himself in John the 10th chapter the good shepherd and would tell how that he, the shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The announcement and invitation would come not to the world's emperors. Oh, I like that. Not to the priests of the day. But at least not to the so-called theologians or the soldiers or the scholars or the Pharisee or the Sadducees. No, this would be reserved for some of what society would consider the lowest, the least educated men, ranch hands, if you will, those despised by local people, men who 
their skin glistened with sweat and they didn't smell real good. That's still, God's still choosing those kind of people today. Amen? Amen. Walking right past the noble and walking <clears throat> right past the pious and the hip hypocrite and those who are self-righteous. Amen? Mm -hmm. And choosing us rednecks that know we ain't nothing without Him. Mm -hmm. William Barclay, the great historian and commentator, would write it like this. Wonder and how it should have been displayed, first of all, to the shepherds. He said, it's a wonderful thing that the first announcement of God came to some shepherds. Shepherds were despised by the orthodox people of the day. They were unable to keep the details of the ceremonial law. They could not observe all the most meticulous hand washings and rules of the synagogue or the Pharisees. Yet it was these simple men of the field that God's message first came. Jesus' first visitors to the manger would be who? The shepherds. Men that had been rejected by society. And there's another reason that he would choose shepherds. We all know that the Bible talks about Jesus being the Lamb of God. The sacrificial Lamb of God. Scholars say that these sheep that were kept just outside Jerusalem were sacrificial sheep. They were sheep that were being raised for particularly one reason. To be used as sacrifice in the temple. God would choose this place to an all. Oh, this stuff just, there ain't no way. If you, even if you believe in coincidence, you'd be stretching it to get to this. Mm -hmm. Amen. Every, every eye dotted. Every T crossed. My son, born of a virgin. Amen. Laid, born in a lowly place in manger in Bethlehem. A birth announced to shepherds that are watching over the sacrificial sheep. And of course, the angels that he would see. And the Bible says in Luke 2 and 9, we're still in the second chapter of the book of Luke, ninth verse. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, now see, one angel wasn't enough for this. Talking about celebrating. <laughs> Talking about being happy. How many people ever came across the happy daddy, you know, and... He said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a new father. He, they either give you a cigar or a piece of bubble gum looks like a cigar. Amen. Say, I'm, I'm a father of a new boy, of a new girl. Well, the father's showing off his stuff this night. Amen. His son has been born in the city of David, just like it had been promised all throughout the years. It didn't just take one angel to do this. It says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host Praising. Now that, mul that word multitude means fullness. It means field. I believe they filled the sky, Brother Sleeves. I believe those shepherds sitting out there on that hillside, the angel of the Lord was telling them that you're going to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then all of a sudden the sky was full of angels. Amen? And a multitude of the heavenly host, all that had been commissioned from the portals of glory, said glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. The Savior that Isaiah spoke of, the Savior that Micah spoke of, the Savior that I prophesied to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He's here. He's here. He has finally came. He has finally came. There's a new kid in town. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen to this. And it came to pass as the angels had went away from them into heaven, the shepherds <coughs> said one to another, Let us now even go into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning the child. <coughs> Birth announced to shepherds, prophesied for years and years before it would take place. God's promise to His people and not just to the Jewish people, but to us. God's promise to us. His Savior given so that we could have everlasting life. The Son of God, God in the flesh, born of a virgin, laid in a manger. Can you imagine 
And God's not done yet. <clears throat> God's not done yet. Listen, what else He would do? The Bible says, turn with me to Matthew, the second chapter, and I'm closing. You think, well, that's great. You know, God <clears throat> sent, a, sent the angel of the Lord and He had the heavenly host with Him and they made the announcement to the shepherds. Now God's done. He's, he, he didn't do anything else. That's about all of it, isn't it? No, no, that's not all of it. Matthew, the second chapter, in the first verse, Matthew 2 and 1, says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is that? Where is he that is born? King of the Jews. Had they heard a rumor? That's not what it says, is it? It says, For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now these men were not kings, as our song says, We three kings of Orion are. They were star watchers. They studied the stars. But they saw something the night that Jesus was born that they had never seen before. They had seen the stars. They would not have traveled this far for a star they had seen before. No, but there was a new star. The Father would create a new star and hang it in the heavens for the birth of His Son. Amen? His star. We've seen His star in the east and we've come to worship Him. Of course, we know what Herod did. Herod wanted to know where he was at too because they called him king. But Herod didn't want to worship him like the wise men did. Herod wanted to kill him. Amen? Amen. They say in verse 5, they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, you want to know where was he born at? And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Now see, they knew the Scripture more so than most of the Jewish people of that day apparently. Because here these men come all the way from the east, you know, they're traveling, they're looking, they're following the star because they knew what the Scripture had to say about the night the king would be born. They said, we followed his star from the east and it says, they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, talking about what the prophet had said, for thus it is written by the prophet, talking about the Scripture in Micah that we just got through reading. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So the wise men, they travel all of the way. that they and I, that No one's sure exactly how many miles, but it's a long journey. I can tell you this much, that every scholar that's worth his salt would tell you that by the time they got to where Jesus was at, he was two years old. So they spent two years traveling. From the time that they saw the star and began to follow the star that that God had hung in the heaven just for His Son. His star. And it says in verse 9, when they had heard the king, because he said, you go find him. Come tell me where he's at. I want to worship him too. But he wanted to kill him because he didn't want nobody to be king but him. He felt threatened by this baby that had been born. It says, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And it says, When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now listen to that star. Listen about that star. It wasn't just any other ordinary star. It moved. It traveled and it led them to the place where the child was at and then it stopped. Right there. You talk about making a big fuss over your baby. God celebrating the birth of His Son creates a, a unique, one-of-a-kind star that these stargazers would follow for two years. It didn't look like other stars. It wasn't like any other billions of stars that, that were in the sky. It was like no other star they had seen. This baby would be like no other baby they had seen. The star was unique. This baby was unique. The star was created for a purpose, came for a purpose, led them for a reason. This baby came for a reason to save a lost and dying world. I think this star was probably the most beautiful and unique star that these star watchers had ever seen. Or they wouldn't have followed it for two years. 
But I think as they gazed upon the face of Jesus, I think that the star fades in comparison to that beauty. You see, that night a star was born not only in the sky, but in the manger. And I talked to you about them knowing the Scriptures. The Old Testament says, I shall see Him, but not now. I shall behold Him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Jesus would call Himself in Revelation, the 22nd chapter, the 16th verse, I, Jesus, have sent Mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. See, God does everything for a reason. Sometimes we do things and people scratch their head and wonder why in the world they do that. God always has a reason. These wise men who came from afar would bow before the newborn king as we not only do this morning, but we do 365 days a year, the bright and morning star. God would commission, would commission angels. He would commission the heavenly host. He would create a new star to announce the birth of His Son. In closing this morning, I realized that throughout the Christmas season, many almost most lose sight of the real reason to celebrate. It was my prayer this morning that not only through Christmas, but throughout every day of the rest of our life, that we make Christ the center of our attention. And we realize, you know, people say, well, what's the big deal about Christmas? Well, God seemed to think it was a pretty big deal. Only time He commissioned the heavenly host only time that I read in Scripture that He created a new star. <clears throat> so as we celebrate this Christmas season, let's celebrate the way the Father celebrated. Celebrate the birth of the Son that came to give His life for us. I'm so glad this morning for Jesus. I'm so glad this morning that He came. And not only that He came, but He finished the work that the Father sent Him to do. You see, before He was born, the devil dreaded that. He didn't want him to be born, but once he was born, he did everything he could to keep him going to the cross because he knew that was the final blow. That would be the thing that chopped his head off. His finished work of the cross. The announcement of the birth of the Son of God. That's what Christmas is about. That's what it should be about in our lives. Someone else this morning have something before we go.